Dulux is a household name in Australia, but this year is the first time that Dulux, Dulux has been a listed company in its own right. Spun out from Orica last year, the paint, coatings and garden care product supplier announced a half-year net profit of $48.7 million and is on track to beat its full-year 2010 net profit of $71.5 million, which is the pro forma figure before demerger costs. Dulux chief executive is Patrick Houlihan, and I spoke with him earlier. Patrick Houlihan, welcome to Late Line Business. Thank you, Tiki. Glad to join you. Well, not a bad result in quite a patchy market. You've had a deliberate strategy around your branding. How have you fared against competitors because you've had the likes of Metcash and, and Bunnings all coming in? Yeah, look, in terms of our business, we very much focus twofold. Um, firstly, in terms of being very consumer driven, and we do that through our brands, and we have very iconic brands in Dulux, Sally's, Yates, and Cabot's, plus many, many more. Um, and we support that through marketing, investment, and innovation. But at the same time, we very much have a long term track record of fo focusing on customer satisfaction, and we rank in the top 2% of companies in Australia around supply chain performance in consumer goods sectors and our sales force effectiveness has proven to be industry leading as well. You were hard hit by the Queensland floods at your factory in Rock Lee. How will that impact the second half and have you resolved the insurance? Look, I've been delighted at how rapidly our team responded to the recovery of Rock Lee. Um, it's a very significant part of our supply chain infrastructure and products that come from it um, equate to about 50% of our Dulux Group revenues. We still expect to see in the second half some further um, costs relating to repair of the plant and so on and some ongoing tolling costs from third parties. We will manage those through the insurance recoveries process and all of that's worked very well to date. So it's just a matter of us working through that. Um, but we, we believe the fundamentally important thing is that we've got the business up and running, we've delivered the result for our shareholders, and importantly, we do not envisage any loss of market share um, in a permanent sense as a result of this significant disruption. Now, there's been quite a lot of consolidation with big international players picking up Torbmans and Wattle, and yet you've managed to keep market share. How have you done that? All around the world, if you look at successful decorative paint companies, and, and by the way, decorative paints makes up about 60% of our revenues, um, they're, they're fundamentally strong regional players. And often that's driven by the fact that the, one of the most important things is having strong brands for that connection to consumers. And the other thing is making sure you've got that organisational infrastructure and culture to back up um, those elements of customer satisfaction I touched on early before. So the fact we've, we really have been um, consistently focusing on those for many, many years, um, we've continued to build on them. When the likes of Nippon Paints from Asia come and leave, um, that's probably the third or fourth international player we've seen arrive and then depart because um, of their inability to gain traction in the areas I mentioned. And at the same time, we've got PPG and Velspar from the United States owning Wattle and Torbmans. But the momentum we're seeing, again, just really goes to reinforce the things that we've been focusing on are indeed the right things that make a successful, strong regional player. I noticed a Facebook link on your page. Do you see a lot of value in social media? Um, we do. We see it as one part of a, a collective engagement of consumers. Um, uh, ultimately, when we think about home ownership in Australia and the fact that you've got quite a diverse demographic participating in that, we need to communicate in various forms. You're looking at further expansion into Asia. Uh, China, you're there already. It's quite a tough market there, though, and, and is the strong dollar affecting you? Um, in terms of the, the latter part of your question, we tend to manufacture most of the products we sell in, in each country within that country, so there's less of, a, of an FX impact there. It becomes more relevant um, as those bits of our offshore business become larger. We do get some dilution on translation of earnings as the Aussie dollar moves higher, but at this stage, 80% um, of our revenues are based here in Australia. In terms of the business, what we're trying to do in China, we're really taking a view to the medium to long term. We acquired one of the leading wood care businesses in Shanghai about two and a half years ago, and that provided us with about 750 points of customer distribution. And on top of that distribution, we've now been overlaying our broad array of paints and Sally's products 
um, and really bringing some of our capabilities to bear. So it's this fine balance between investing strategically for the medium to long term, but at the same time delivering the operational result. You've been with Dulux for over 20 years. How is life different as a public company? Look, it's, um, you're right. Uh, to have joined uh, uh, Dulux, in my case, as a, as a chemist, uh, when we're part of ICI globally, that was pretty much for, for 10 years of my career. And then the next 10 years was under Orica ownership. And just last year, we came out on our own. And look, look whilst we were very focused on preparation for the demerger, once you're on the other side of the ledger and you are in charge of your own destiny, it really does open your mind to what's possible. Um, we now have a board of directors who are very focused on our business as opposed to um, us being, you know, a small part of an overall larger company as we were in the case of Orica. We've got investors who want to focus and invest in this type of business. And as management, we're really saying with the fundamentally great assets we've got in the business, the capabilities, the customer relationships, what else is possible? And that really... Um, is that broadening of perspective um, that, that really changes the game in terms of the way you think about things and ultimately why I think demergers as a general rule have shown to be quite favourable for shareholders. Patrick Houlihan, very good to talk to you for your first results. Thank you, Tiki.